I have two main texts for you today to draw your attention to, and but we will we will look at things some more broadly than just these two. The first of them is in Hebrews chapter two, verses fourteen and fifteen. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, referring to Christ, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Uh, The point of my first talk, for any of you who weren't there, is that God is completely sovereign over the activities of the entire demonic world, even though he is completely good and their activities are completely evil, yet God uh, uses those activities for his good purposes. And this talk is about one thing, namely that Christ triumphed over Satan and all his hosts in his death, that's the reference in Hebrews, and in his resurrection, which is the first phase towards his ascension and his rule over all authorities and powers, Ephesians 1. But I want to draw your attention to one other text, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and through 20. Uh, The Lord had commissioned his 12 apostles earlier to go out with the message of the kingdom. And now in chapter 10, he commissions 70 or 72, there's textual variant, uh, 72 others, a larger company, to go out with the message. Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So the priority, that last verse, the priority is very clear. Power in and of itself is not the goal of Christian living. The goal is fellowship with God, and and it is salvation, which is uh, summed up with your names being written in heaven at this point. But the Lord did give these uh, people commissioned by him power in his name. And I know that that mission of the apostles and the mission of the 72 was special, unrepeatable, and yet uh, the principle is more general. That the the Lord, uh, in his name, has power through our prayers, through our sonship under him, to subdue the powers of evil. one of, there was a missionary, I think in Thailand, walking out at night and praying, and a woman coming the other direction screamed out in fear. He realized that the woman thought he was a, a spirit. So he assured him, I'm human. The woman came up to him and said, why are you out late at night? Aren't you afraid of the spirits? And he said, no, the spirits are afraid of me. Well, not, not of him in and of himself, if that be isolated from his being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Uh, but he is right that the element of fear should and is reversed. And, and you can see this in the celebration of these 72, that they've experienced the power of God. Well, what happened to this a family that I told you part of the story of, that uh, Westminster-related family, where the pastor 
had, had prayed for another family in his church to be free from a demon that was, that was uh, giving horrible pictures of broken toys to their son. So that family was free. Nothing ever happened after that. But when the pastor came home and some a day later maybe, his own son was being attacked in the same way. Well, that's, how can that be? I mean, there is Christians who say, well, you know, we belong to Christ. The demons can't touch us. Well, they can't hurt you in an ultimate sense. Your name is written in heaven. But you are still within this world subject to attacks. And uh, this was a, a, a kind of, shock, must have been a shocking thing to the pastor. So uh, he phoned me. That's how I got involved in it. And, uh, and decided, you know, we need some more prayer and activity. And, and that's one of the things about the, the kingdom of God that we are, uh, we are also helped by the prayers, not only the prayers of Christ interceding for us at the right hand of God. Of course, that's central but the prayers of other Christians. So my wife and I agreed to come over to their house, and we would pray for the whole family, including this son. So we went over, and we shared some Scripture, because one of the things about this, I mean, the son was frightened by these visions of these horrible things, and uh, the, the, one of the, uh, the, the weapons of Satan is fear. We see that in this very verse in Hebrews 2, right? The fear of death, but then that's the biggest fear under which are a lot of subordinate fears uh, that, you, uh, that, that Satan can use. So we shared some scripture and, and things like these verses with the entire family, and we prayed specifically for the son who was quite young. But the fact is that the Lord... Uh, can protect even the young ones, and that they can begin to pray and cry out to him, and that sends the demons away. So we prayed for them, and we left, and the son never had a problem again. But then this same pastor called us up again, and he said, my wife is being attacked. She is hearing these whispering voices of uh, accusing and name-calling uh, that follow her around the house. Well, that, that's kind of formidable because you think, didn't we deal with this? Isn't, doesn't the Lord hear our prayers? It's easy to lose faith. And to, to, if you don't go back to the Scripture and say, look, this is what God has done. This is, Christ has really triumphed over these demons. Why are they fooling around? So we went back, but this time we took some other people with us. And, and we usually fast uh, beforehand in this kind of situation, right? Fasting is not a magic talisman that makes everything okay, but it's a way of saying we're serious about this. Lord, we, we are committed to you. We want you to hear our prayers and so we prepared that way, and we took with us one fellow who had been a missionary in Africa. By the way, some of your African brothers, if you want to talk to them, they understand. <laughs> so this African uh, missionary to Africa, and he, though he was, grew up in, uh, in America, he understood. He went with us, and one other gentleman who was a Westminster alumnus, actually, in Philadelphia, but it had some experience already. So we went and we all prayed beforehand. We went into the house and again we shared scripture. And uh, one of the things I found myself saying is uh, it, to the family is saying, you know, this can feel very discouraging, uh, but the Lord can use this because I said to the wife, you know, you need to grow in understanding the Lord and to get beyond the fears because of the Lord's promises and to be able to stand up to this and tell the devil and his agents to flee. So we prayed with the whole family. We left. The family was never troubled again. That's not because we are something special, 
right? Or the people with us were something special. Because Christ is something special. He's someone special. And the principle here is, if you believe in Christ, you become a child of God. You have access to the divine throne, not only of grace, but of power. The power of the resurrection of Christ. It's not your power to use the way, any way you wish to do, but it's the power of the kingdom of God. And that means that you have authority through Christ and through prayer to him to, to uh, uh, exercise the power of God on behalf of your brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to mention a little bit of the picture of the works of Satan in the rest of our time here so that we understand the full scope. And I mentioned that there are books in, in the uh, Scripture passages. There's a handout that is at the back of the auditorium that has these scriptural passages. But there are whole books on the armor of God and on spiritual warfare. The Puritans were very good at this kind of thing. Uh, but uh, the, the activity of Satan and his hosts is much broader than this kind of more obvious thing uh, with, with the demons giving people uh, bad visions and things. Uh, the, the first thing to notice from the Scripture is that the devil is a liar. He's the number one liar in the whole world. John 8, 44 to 45. And, and we'll see some of the effects of that, but one of the lies is basically you have to fear the demons. There's no way you can, you can be free of them. And so uh, John 8, 44 says, you are of your father the devil. Jesus accuses his Jewish opponents and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and it does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Similarly, Revelation 12, 9, the Satan appears in a vision in the form of a dragon and he's said to be the deceiver of the whole world. The primary deceit, of course, is in keeping people in unbelief. And that's the next point, 1 John 5, 19. And there are other passages of this kind. 1 John 5, 19 tells about the dichotomy in the world. We know that we are from God. And he's talked about criteria for that primarily belief in Christ. We know that we are from God. And the whole world, you see that, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So, yes, there are instances of unusual activity of demons, but the broader picture is if any time you meet a non-Christian, you are meeting somebody who is in the power of the evil one. So this is widespread, and we have to be aware of that. I think sometimes people, you know, they lose sight of that. There's a thing sometimes called reform deism. It's a contradiction in terms, but it's people who on paper are reformed, but who act as if God is far away and the demons are non-existent. But the, the reality is we who belong to Christ are in his kingdom, and everyone else belongs in the kingdom of Satan. Colossians 1.13, likewise. He has delivered us. He, that is Christ, has delivered us. Well, it's God. Uh, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. What that? Of course, the kingdom of the evil one. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Likewise, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Next, the area of heresy. Now, the heresy is a form of lie, right? But it's very specific in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 to 3, the involvement of evil spirits in heretical 
teachers. Chapter 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to what? To deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Likewise, 2 Timothy, next book over, chapter 2, verse 24, and the Lord's servant, Paul addressing Timothy as a servant of the Lord, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. And one thing which I think actually helps us to take seriously the necessity of this kind of patience is understanding who was the opponent. Correcting his opponents. There are opponents who are teaching falsely. Correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now, you can see the element of, of demonic deceit right here. It's the lies of the devil. But it seems to me that the Apostle Paul is making this statement generally about heretics and about opponents of the truth, that they are all in the captivity of the devil. Of course, there is evil and sin in their own hearts, but in a sense, they are also to be pitied because they are captive by one stronger and more clever than they are. So I believe it's legitimate to deduce from this that any time you're dealing with a heretic, you're dealing with something which has demons in the background. Now, that doesn't mean that these people are demon-possessed, and that's, we'll come to that in, uh, in the time that remains. Uh, the activity of Satan is a, a broad umbrella of activity in opposing God. 1 Corinthians 10.20, idolatry brings people into the company and captivity of demons. 1 Corinthians 10.20. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, right? So these are idolatrous forms of worship in the Roman world. What pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God, I do not want you to be participants with demons. In other words, you as Christians, there were kind of freewheeling Christians who said, well, I know that idols are not the real thing, so it doesn't matter. I can go and participate in the feast. Well, idols are not the real thing. They're not God. But behind those physical objects, there is something exceedingly dark. It's demons. And in places of the world where idolatry of a gross kind is rampant, in Taiwan, there are temples all over the place, some other parts of the world too, temples that are dedicated to various spirits. Well, in that kind of situation, there's always demons that are in the background of that idolatrous worship, and people come and engage in that worship, then they are subject to manipulation by the demons. And uh, finally, there is the area of demon possession that occurs in the Gospels and in Acts. And there's debate, of course, whether... Uh, this continues to this day, although if you're in certain parts of the world, you probably will have your questions answered. But uh, I do believe that there's a kind of unique uh, concentration and breakout of demonic activity during the earthly life of Christ. It's, it's as if this is Satan's big chance, right? 
and, and the kingdom of God is coming in Jesus and it's confronting the kingdom of Satan and these, all these bondages, right, that Satan and his hosts have, have been tempted to bring into the world. And so there's a unique kind of intensity of outbreak of the conflict that you can see in the Gospels. And then, of course, it continues into Acts. And I'm not saying that that, that unique intensity is going to continue today. I think we have to respect the, the contours of Scripture and the contours of redemptive history. Uh, but it does mean that if you give yourself to Satan, even in this time, then you may get more than you ask for. Right? So people who are involved in a cult or involved in open idolatry, as I've described it, uh, some of them may have uh, profound encounters uh, with the demonic. And uh, the Acts 19, 12 suggests to me that the whole category of demon possession is not some kind of technical analysis of some kind of inner secret knowledge, but rather is something that can be observed from the outside and fairly uh, quickly be identified, Acts 19.12, so that, yeah, uh, verse 12, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that touched his skin, that is Paul's, were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Well, this is an extraordinary instance because it, uh, it's, it's items of clothing from the Apostle Paul that God used uh, in, in the uh, driving out of demons. But it's an interesting verse because uh, Paul wasn't physically present. So how did the people who were present how were they able to understand that this was the demons uh, came out of them? It suggests that it's something fairly easy to understand. Uh, There was a a married couple who grew up as humanists. They didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in the spirit world. But they, as it were, devoted their, their loyalty to blessing human beings. So it was the time when the Peace Corps was a big thing, and they signed up for the Peace Corps, and they were sent to some uh, part of the world to do a project, right, to help the people out, dig wells, build hospitals, something of that kind. But in this other environment, they saw things that they couldn't explain. They came, in spite of their humanism and Western materialism to admit to themselves demons exist. The spirit world exists because we can't explain what we're seeing. And then they said, if demons exist, maybe God exists. And if God exists, then maybe we better find out who he is. (laughs) They became Christians. And uh, they went to Gordon-Conwell Seminary. My wife was a student there. And uh, that's how we heard about it. But the fact is that when people open themselves up to the spirit world, they can get trapped in various ways. Now, none of us is given to know all the details of that world. And uh, I hope next time to address some of the practicalities of that world. Uh, Oh, there is one other thing before I leave you. Counterfeit miracles, right? And and this is probably uh, something of what these um, Peace Corps workers experienced. I don't know the details, but 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 11 is almost shocking in the intensity of what happens. Worth looking at this These verses, also Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3, uh, looks at a case where there's a false prophet and he actually performs a sign. The sign actually comes true, and and God says, don't pay attention to him because he's 
proclaiming false gods. So that looks like a counterfeit miracle. But 2 Thessalonians 2.9 is even a better case. The coming of the lawless one, that's the final Antichrist, is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, demonic miracles in effect, and with all wicked deception. Now here's this deception idea uh, as one of the main tools of Satan. For those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So this is shocking. You see that it's because they're outside the truth. If you are outside the truth, you are subject to all kinds of deception. And again, there should be an element of pity mixed with appreciation of the fact of how powerful the forces of evil are that they can work uh, false signs and wonders. Verse 11, therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. It's God sending them a strong delusion. God uses even these satanic miracles for his own purposes that they may believe what is false in order that they that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's actually not so bad a place to stop because it reminds us of the fact of how important the truth is. The fundamental weapon that we have as Christians is the weapon of the gospel. Romans 1.16 this gospel, Paul says, is the power of God, right? If you want to worry about all these satanic powers and exercise of power, this gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. And there's a danger, I think, when, when people hear stories, and admittedly I've told a few stories here, but there's a, there's a danger that people feel I have to have extra biblical knowledge. I have to have some kind of secrets, uh, talismans, or, or exorcistic formulas, something of that kind to protect myself and to perhaps then be able to deliver people, other people, out of the bondage of Satan. No, you don't. You have to be a child of God and to believe that your Father in heaven is all-powerful and that he hears you for the sake of Christ and that Christ has already triumphed over the whole host of wickedness. You have to believe those things and you grow in that through the Scripture, right? And you proclaim that message to people who are in bondage. And it's well worth looking, appreciating, that 2 Timothy 3.17, see, 3.16 we all know, right? All Scripture is breathed out by God. But then it continues and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So you don't have to have extra secret esoteric knowledge about the demonic well, world. What you have to have is a knowledge of the Scripture. And you come with that knowledge, but also with a conviction, right, that God is your Father. And that in the name of Christ, who has triumphed over the devil, you can proclaim deliverance to others. Some Years ago, I received a phone call out of the blue. It was a woman's voice, and she said, Can you help me? I have a, there's a demon that has taken up residence in my spine. And he's in the form of a dragon about three feet long, and I want to be delivered. So what do you do? Well, I'll leave that for next time. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you 
that the message of salvation truly is the power of God for salvation, that people can be rescued. We ourselves have experienced that rescue by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and that we can come to you as our Father and ask for that deliverance to be uh, manifest to other people throughout the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.